Hello and welcome back to Entrepreneur India. As the world looks to emerge from the shadow of, of the coronavirus pandemic, 2022 so far has been defined by precarious geopolitical relations, drastically shifting economic trends and rapidly evolving technological landscape. This season, we at Carnegie India are examining many of the challenges and opportunities that India will confront in the coming decade. I'm your host Suresh Rai. In this episode of Interpreting India, we analyze why India and other major economies are experiencing high inflation, the measures that have been taken to control inflation, the expected impact of these measures on economic growth and other developmental indicators, and the future course of action. Joining us today for this discussion is Radhika Pandey. Radhika is a senior fellow at National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. Her academic work focuses on macroeconomics, business cycles, uh, financial policy and regulation. She has been a part of a number of Ministry of Finance Institute committees and writes regularly on contemporary economic issues. Hello Radhika, welcome to Interpreting India. Thank you Suresh, thank you for having me. So perhaps we could begin by taking stock of the global picture. What is the inflationary landscape right now? And as people have been writing that in the advanced uh, developed economies, uh, inflation has been at the highest in more than three decades. And even in the emerging and <laughs> developing economies, it's been uh, highest in more than a decade. So uh, when, if you can just uh, help us understand what the current global inflationary landscape looks like globally. And uh, I mean, where, how did we come here? What are the main drivers of this situation that we are in? Sure. So, see, the obvious driver has been the Russia-Ukraine uh, war. But uh, if we just step back a bit and we look at the pandemic time, the inflationary pressure started building up during that time. So, during the pandemic, we had these supply-side disruptions. And even before that, for some items, like uh, for uh, some of the items which are used in the automobile sector, the chips, we were seeing some kind of shortages there and some kind of supply side disruptions and input cost pressures were building in some sectors. Uh, and then the war aggravated. So during the pandemic, we had supply side disruption. And then the war further aggravated uh, the supply side disruptions, which resulted in the you know spike in prices. What is equally important to note is that, you know, the nature of inflation in advanced economies is a mix of both demand side and supply side, you know, because when we see what kind of policy response was initiated by the governments in advanced economies, they initiated uh, uh, huge fiscal packages. Uh, they gave money, what is termed as helicopter money. They gave money in the hands of people uh, to, uh, you know, mitigate the pain of uh, the pandemic. Uh, so at that time, when the supply side was uh, weak, the supply side was tight. At that time, when demand was increased, we saw a s more, uh, you know, the aggravation of inflationary pressures, and we saw a pent up demand uh, taking. Uh, taking shape when the economy started opening up. So when we saw some uh, slide in the COVID cases, uh, while supply side disruptions take time to ease, uh, the demand pressure started rising and, and that resulted in increase in uh, prices. So that was the condition during the pandemic, which was further accentuated by the uh, uh, war, which further uh, you know created supply side tightness, particularly in commodities like uh, crude oil, uh, metals, uh, fertilizers, and so on. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the that's the the point on key drivers, and if we talk about the inflationary landscape, uh, as you rightly pointed out, in uh, economies like US and UK, inflation has touched record highs. Inflation has risen to eight point six percent when the target is around two percent. The inflation target is two percent, so inflation has been rising, and you know it's now become entrenched. It was it started with a few items. It started with you know interestingly started the things like used cars and now it has become more broad based it is now not only limited to goods it's it's uh, sp uh, spilled over to services and therefore we see you know aggressive uh, you know, uh, policy rate hikes by the central banks right now coming to india uh, you said that the target uh, inflation rate in most of the developed countries is a 2% our target rate is 4% with a tolerance band of 2 to 6% right and now for about five months, the inflation has been higher than 6%. And uh, uh, 
I mean, even though there was a slight moderation from April to May, there was a slight decline, and but still, it was about seven percent in May as well. So the situation is still uh, of, of high inflation, I would say. What What are the some of the reasons that are India specific for inflation in India, and also what extent do you think the inflation has been imported because there's a global inflationary kind of pressure building up, and India cannot remain untouched from that. So. How, what are the factors that are India specific and what are global factors driving inflation in India? So, uh, again, going back to the pandemic time, you know, now we see inflation rising above 6%. But even from the second uh, half of 2021, we saw inflation rising. and uh, Inflation was inching up towards 6%. And during that time, it was primarily due to the pandemic and due to the pandemic-induced uh, disruption, uh, the supply-side shortages primarily. Now what is happening is that, again, due to what there are supply-side disruptions, but at the same time, uh, because the COVID cases have receded and the economy is opening up, so we are seeing a revival in demand. In some indicators, we can see that, you know, the, through some indicators, we can see that demand is reviving. Uh, so while, again, the same kind of a, uh, uh, a policy picture where uh, demand has started to pick up, whereas supply-side uh, disruptions still persist, so that is the reason for inflation. But there are, again, uh, you know, the uh, bulk of the inflation problem is uh, due to external headwinds, but there are domestic factors as well. Uh, there are these extreme weather conditions that have uh, resulted in increase in prices of cereals, particularly wheat. Uh, uh, we saw a shortage in the uh, wheat production Whatever was uh, estimated, projected in the uh, advance estimates, we did not reach that target. Uh, as a result, India uh, had to announce export ban on wheat uh, uh, because of this reason to you know, improve the supply of wheat. Uh, so while primarily it has been driven by uh, international factors, uh, but now what's happening, it started with international factors, but now due to demand also picking up, we are seeing that the inflation has become more broad-based. We are seeing uh, not only in goods, but also in services, inflation is picking up because, you know, in, in sectors, the contact intensive sectors, which were earlier showing a muted growth, are, not, are now showing revival. Uh, so people are increasing demand, people are stepping out, so we are seeing increase in demand there. So supply-side disruptions coupled with revival of demand alongside extreme weather conditions, these are some of the factors that have contributed to uh, now a broad-based inflation in India. Now, obviously, the policymakers have to respond to the uh, situation and they are <laughs> taking steps. So on uh, April 8th, uh, the RBI's Monetary Policy Committee decided to keep the repo rate unchanged. But on May 4th, they decided to raise the rate by about 40 basis points to over 4.4%. And then uh, again on 8th June, they uh, decided to uh, raise the rate to 4.9%. The CRR was also raised by about 50 basis points to about 4.5%. So do you think the mm -hmm. RBI has acted in a timely manner? And uh, is, is this response adequate? So there are two parts to this question, whether the RBI should have acted earlier on, on hindsight, of course, and uh, whether this particular this response is adequate for the kind of uh, situation that we're in. So uh, coming to the first question, which is on whether this uh, could have been done earlier or not, whatever aggressive now policy tightening that we are seeing. So uh, to that question, I would say that, you know, the de facto uh, tightening of monetary policy started from the second half of 2021, where we saw uh, Reserve Bank doing more of, you know, absorption of liquidity. While we did not see interest rate hike, but uh, de facto policy tightening started in uh, uh, from the end of alongside towards the end of uh, last year, calendar year last year, where they started doing more of uh, what is termed as variable rate reverse repo auctions, uh, which are used to withdraw liquidity. So that is one thing, that is one manifestation of a reversal of uh, their ultra accommodative monetary policy. The other part is that they did not extend uh, what is termed as the GSAP, the Government Securities Acquisition Program, where they were buying government bonds and infusing liquidity. So that was another instrument of accommodative uh, monetary policy, which they discontinued. So uh, 
they gradually did start with the uh, uh, policy tightening uh, but the uh, the real change happened from uh, the april policy and if you look at their guidance uh, the monetary policy statement that is announced alongside their resolution it said that they they for the first time they mentioned withdrawal of accommodation till then the priority was on growth but uh, from april they started talking about uh, withdrawal of accommodation and then in may they came up with this surprise uh, policy hike at the same time when uh, the us fed had to hike the interest rate so uh, we are seeing that the our reserve bank is uh, responding but again the situation has been so uncertain so i think it will be unfair to say that reserve bank was uh, behind the curve because at that time the uh, priority uh, the heavy lifting on uh, for supporting growth was done by reserve bank of india the government's policy response was uh, you know again supply side oriented and again focused on credit which was the mandate of the reserve bank so reserve bank did much much of the task of uh, you know supporting growth and mitigating the distress caused by the uh, pandemic and we do see some of the positive impact of that and from october onwards they they did start with uh, withdrawal of accommodation uh, and again here it's important to uh, you know understand that the nature of inflation in advanced economies and uh, india was uh, different primarily because of the policy response that uh, advanced economies government primarily the us adopted and what india adopted we did not have uh, a fiscal package kind of a support which the us did and therefore their inflation uh, was more of demand led which could be addressed by interest rate hikes at that time so they started giving this communication that you know now we are going to uh start raising rates they started you know changing their uh, uh guidance they started giving forward guidance on the fact that now is the time to uh you know shift focus from growth to inflation whereas india continued to focus rbi continued to focus on growth till say january february the focus was on growth and then from april onwards it shifted while some kind of uh no de facto withdrawal started happening from uh, october itself so i think it was a fair assessment because nobody could have anticipated the war and the uh, steep supply side tightness that have uh, arisen due to the, the war so i think during that time and given the conditions uh, i think it uh, it's, it's unfair to say that rbi uh, fell behind the curve now what is doing is uh, raising the rates and that is the only blunt policy instrument in the hands of the uh, reserve bank to uh, address inflation which it is doing and uh, based on the trajectory of how inflation uh, uh, move they have themselves given this projection that you know till the end of this year inflation would not be uh, below 6% so to control that they would have to raise rates and raise rates in such a way that at least the real rate turns marginally positive to give some kind of incentive to savers otherwise uh, if we have if we keep having negative real return then whatever you know the the deposit mobilization will not ha- happen and whatever credit growth we are seeing that will not be sustainable that will not be supported so now the role of monetary policy at this point of time is to uh, effectively anchor inflationary expectations uh, in a way that uh, Uh, to to come up with rate hikes in a way that you know the real rate turns at least marginally positive you made a comment on fiscal policy as well so i want to go down that tangent a little bit before we come back come back to this that remember back in 2020 there was a big chorus to uh demanding uh, big st- fiscal support and uh, you know uh, basically increasing deficit even further beyond what was uh, be increased to be able to support demand in the economy now if i'm reading you right you seem to be saying that uh, if we had done that if the government had done that it today would have been a much more difficult situation not just fiscally but also in terms of inflation which seems to be the major driver in many of the, of the developed countries so now obviously we have because of not embarking upon that kind of a strategy we have saved up a little bit of fiscal space and uh, 
uh, what can the uh, government do? So RBI is doing what it is doing in terms of monetary policy uh, mm-hmm. actions. But what can the government do uh, to help in this inflation uh, fight? So if to to be able to stem it basically, because if you look at uh, uh, compared India's inflation to the uh, uh, inflation in developed countries, we are we are not doing too badly because our I mean uh, tolerance band is also very different from their tolerance band. So we are not way above that while they are in a very different zone especially in countries like U- us or we come in a different zone but we need to be careful and we may need to ensure that it doesn't get out of the out of out of hand is there anything that fiscal policy can do in this regard so uh, government has already taken some steps on fiscal front like we saw that uh, excise duty cuts were announced on petrol and diesel and on uh, subsidies the on, on fertilizers the subsidies was enhanced from what was uh, given in the budget so again you know from fiscal side the government can continue to do these things it has been doing like on edible uh, oils it had slashed the import duties at the time when indonesia had banned the uh, import of uh, palm oil and uh, so on so on edible oils on subsidies on on uh, crude oil they have uh, reduced duties and increased subsidy uh, and increased subsidies uh, but again the the, the there is a, a trade off you know how much duty cuts can be uh, made uh, because if your fiscal deficit gets too much deviated from what you had targeted and then you are going to borrow more uh, that will lead to increase in interest rates and it will it has its own set of uh, implications which are very adverse to uh, the, uh, for the revival of an economy like india because if your interest rates start rising then again the poor would be more adversely uh, affected because investments will not happen job creation will not happen so that kind of a balancing act between uh, you know acting to uh, tame inflation to you know take steps from the fiscal front so these are the steps, you know, uh, uh, the steps that the duty cuts and uh, increase in subsidies to cushion the impact of the global surge in prices. But again, there are complex trade-offs that uh, every government faces as to how much duty cuts to give so that fiscal deficit does not deviate too much from the target because it then has an impact on private investment. It leads to crowding out of uh, private investment. Now, coming back to the uh, inflation and monetary policy action against inflation. So, obviously, the rate hike is quite recent. A couple of months back, it happened. It happened again a month ago. So, what are some of the early signs you're seeing in terms of transmission of the monetary policy? Is it uh, already happening or is there... Uh, uh, I mean, usually what is said in India is that there's a big lag uh, between monetary policy decisions and their actual <laughs> I mean, transmission into the economy. So what are the signs that you're seeing as of now? So one sign is that, you know, the interest rates have started to rise, you know, the lending rates. If you look at the monetary policy transmission towards the lending rates, that has been very fast because now most of the banks follow an external benchmark to price their loans. So uh, that has been that has already started happening. While on the deposit side also, some of the banks have raised their interest rates, but not to that level. And that is understandable because deposit rates are sticky. But we should see uh, going forward some hike in deposit rates. So uh, so that is one element of uh, uh, transmission that we are seeing that, you know, interest rate hikes leading to um, uh, increase in lending rate. What we also need to see going forward is, you know, the the, the Reserve Bank of India's inflation expectation surveys that are released. So how will they be impacted? Because the lending rate and deposit is one element. But what is important to see is that whether due to these rate hikes, the inflation expectations are getting anchored or not. The one year, three year near term inflation expectations are getting anchored or not so that will be the real test and the real challenge uh, and i think for that purpose it is needed to have more certainty and predictability and better communication and forward guidance that you know we will continue to uh, uh, raise rates till inflation is uh, brought under control so that inflationary expectations are uh, anchored otherwise there will be a kind of a, a wage price spiral because then consumers, because inflationary expectations are backward looking, uh, they will demand higher wages. Companies will also start, you know, uh, curbing their investment plans, thinking that inflation is unanchored 
So it will have all sorts of adverse implications on the economy. So what we need to see is that going forward, what happens to uh, inflation uh, expectations? Because once those are uh, there, we see signs of moderation. We should uh, see the improvement. In one of our recent works that we did on inflation targeting, you know, the, the efficacy of inflation targeting over the last five years, uh, it was a study conducted last year. There we did see that, uh, you know, post the introduction of the inflation targeting regime, the inflation expectations were better anchored. So uh, if that is the case, if that uh, continues, we should uh, see a moderation in inflation. But again, if the global headwinds continue uh, to you know, uh, remain elevated, inflation remains elevated, the task of Reserve Bank will become complex because then there are growth implications also, as what we are seeing in the US, there's a talk of recession gaining uh, salience. <clears throat> I want to move a little bit towards the global uh, scenario back again. And we are seeing that the, much of the developed world, especially US, <coughs> Europe, they are uh, waging a war against inflation. Uh, they're taking serious actions. And these are economies with which, with which our economy is also integrated in many ways. <coughs> Investment flows, trade flows are quite significant and <coughs> other uh, connections as well. So what uh, the two-part question. One is, that, what do you, how do you, what would you describe the overall and inflation strategy in these countries? And how do you see that affecting Indian economy? And what are the pathways that uh, through which it can affect Indian eco- economic performance in the coming year or so? Sure. Uh, so, uh, as we discussed, the uh, you know the main strategy which the advanced economies have been adopting is the uh, rate hikes, and since the U.S. has been pursuing aggressive rate hike, they've started with a 25 basis hike, then they did 50 basis hike, then they did a 75 basis hike. So, what we are seeing is that uh, the yields on the U.S. denominated bond is rising. Now. Whenever, uh, if we want to study the uh, trajectory of uh, foreign investors' movement, you know, whether there will be an inflow towards India or other emerging economies or outflows, a very important variable to look at is the, you know, what is the differential between what an Indian bond is offering and what a U.S. bond is offering of a, of a similar maturity. So what a 10-year Indian bond is offering and what a, a 10-year uh, U.S. bond is offering. If that difference is wide, if the Indian bond is offering much higher return than a U.S. bond, then there will be inflows into uh, India, into emerging economy. And that is what we were seeing during the uh, pandemic time because uh, uh, the advanced economies had a very uh, ultra-accommodative policies. They were infusion liquidity. They were expanding their balance sheets. So we were seeing... Uh, the uh, differential between Indian bond return and the U.S. bond return widening, and which led to uh, greater inflows into India. Now, the reverse of that phenomenon is uh, happening. What we are seeing is that uh, while the Indian bond yields are also rising because of inflation concern, but the U.S. bond yield, the the pace of increase in the U.S. bond yield is much more than the Indian uh, bond yield, and therefore the differential is narrowing. And when the differential narrows, given that U.S. is a a safe haven currency, it has the status of reserve, international reserve, therefore we see an outflow from uh, uh, India and other emerging economies to back to the U.S. So due to the aggressive rate hikes which the advanced economies have been following, we are also seeing uh, outflows, a consistent outflow. Since the beginning of this year, we have seen more than 2 lakh uh, crore of outflows already uh, happening. Uh, And this is still continuing. So uh, that is one implication. The other uh, implication of this on the Indian market is that because the situation is highly uncertain, the risk appetite of investors has reduced considerably. And again, there is a you know the tendency to keep focused only on safe haven assets. And therefore, again, the demand for dollar-denominated assets has uh, increased. And that is what, again, we are seeing that the dollar index, which is you know the uh, exchange rate of dollar with respect to a basket of currencies, it has hardened, it has strengthened. So again, we are seeing an outflow from uh, India to uh, these economies. So one of the implications of the U.S. Fed uh, following an aggressive monetary policy is 
consistent outflows from india now why that is a problem is that because you know traditionally we we have a current account deficit because we are an oil importer country we have a current account deficit but the uh, the good thing is that normally we have a surplus on the capital account so much of the deficit in the current account that we see which is the deficit due to you know trade in goods and services because our imports are more than exports that deficit is somewhat bridged by the inflows of foreign investment now that part is also not helping because our current account deficit is widening but on the capital account also we are seeing an outflow so because of this the current account deficit is becoming a more serious problem so these are the two you know implications and because of the current account deficit becoming a serious problem we are seeing a you know depreciation of the rupee because we are an oil importing country our current account is highly vulnerable and at the same time we are seeing a sustained outflows of capital uh, from our country so as a result we are seeing a, a consistent uh, a rupee depreciation and that is not just a phenomenon for india it's a phenomenon for all countries which are commodity importers all countries which are uh, dependent on imports of oil or energy or fertilizers we are seeing this kind of a phenomenon right now also uh, because i mean the effect of uh, many of these anti inflation i mean our uh, policy actions is basically to depress the demand in these countries uh, do you think that there could also be a, a pathway through trade because uh, i mean we do export uh, uh, big to these countries especially our services export but also goods exports go to many of these countries so uh, uh, i mean that may also may be affecting our current account deficit through trade deficit route as well but uh, what what is your kind of uh, view on this yeah so we spoke about inflation affecting the you know global inflation and policy response in uh, towards inflation how it is affecting indian economy now because of this aggressive rate hikes in the us now people are talking about uh, growth getting depressed and therefore some signs of recession uh, happening in the us economy and even in the uh, uh, even in the eu region so because the us gdp had has already contracted in one quarter in jan to march quarter and if it is there is we see another uh, quarter of contraction then technically us will be in recession because the technical definition of recession or the textbook definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of gdp contraction uh, so that way we are seeing and you know there are certain uh, indicators based on previous episodes of recession uh, that can assess whether you know uh, us economy is headed towards recession and one of those indicators is the uh, yield curve inversion so what we are seeing in the us is that the two year uh, yield has risen much more than the 10 year yield normally what happens is your yield curve is steeper you know if your two year bond will offer you lesser as compared to 10 year because you are parking your fund in a 10 year bond for a, a, a greater period than for a two year bond but if the reverse is happening where the two year bond is offering a higher than a 10 year bond uh, return then it is a sign of recession and whenever uh, in the us we have seen this kind of uh, uh, yield curve uh, reversal happening or you know inversion of uh, yield curve we saw recession so it's a kind of a leading indicator for recession in the us so due to some due to these reasons we uh, can infer that there could be some elements of recession or maybe a mild recession in the us in the uh, in uh, this year now if that happens as you rightly pointed out indian economy is integrated you know we may say that you know we have capital controls and we have these restrictions so but de facto india is integrated with the uh, global economy and we are seeing those headwinds uh, so that will have an impact on our uh, trade and investment flows further because you know last year uh, we did record a uh, 400 billion dollars of uh, exports target and going forward our exports will suffer if if there is a uh, recession not only in the us but in the global economy as well so that is uh, one reason that is one uh, channel through which recession will have an impact on the indian economy and that can lead to recession in india as well because you know the other uh, drivers of demand so we consider consumption investment 
exports. So if exports is doing well, uh, you know, economy can be supported at a time when consumption and investment is still picking up or, you know, it still uh, is not reached a sustainable level. It's still anemic. Uh, so in that scenario, if our exports also go down, then there will be weakening tendencies in the uh, economy as well. And that is what we are uh, seeing in some of the World Bank documents that are coming out now as compared to what came out in uh, January or March. Uh, they have all downgraded the growth projections, not only for uh, global economy or for US, but for India as well. Those, our growth is still more than the other economies, but there has been a, a downward revision. So these are all implications of uh, stagflation or a recession kind of a situation in the global scenario. <clears throat> so, I mean, since I'm talking to you, I should bring up the impossible trinity. <laughs> and so, you know, in macroeconomics, there is this impossible trinity that you choose two out of three, whether you can have <laughs> free capital flow, fixed exchange rate, uh, independent or sovereign monetary policy. So as of now, RBI seems to be allowing the rupee to depreciate gradually, right? It is, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's just happening on a regular basis. But uh, in the past, you've seen that RBI is quite sensitive to the rupees valuation and there is a, they, they do intervene to try to, uh, you know, uh, keep it within a certain range that they may have in their mind. It's not clearly publicly stated what they're comfortable with. It's something that they do. So how do you see the macroeconomic management that RBI does basically? And it's in some of the policy instruments, government also has a say changing in the next uh, you know few months to a, to a year under the current situation where there's a steady rupee depreciation as of now high inflation not just in india also <laughs> globally and capital outflows i mean overall happening there are some short periods in which there's been a net inflow as well but overall there is a outflow happening is there any i mean uh, big shift you you are seeing in terms you would see in terms of the overall macroeconomic management in the next few months or so uh, so, as you rightly said, you know, RBI has been juggling three objectives. You know, RBI is doing exchange rate management and inflation management. And the third objective is that it is the debt manager to the uh, government borrowing. So, it is uh, kind of juggling between these three objectives. And now it's becoming increasingly uh, complicated for RBI to focus on any one objective. So while legally, you know, uh, RBI is uh, supposed to be inflation targeter, but time and again, it uh, intervenes in the uh, foreign exchange market to arrest the rupee slide. It has been doing that. It's not that it is not intervening. We can see that in the uh, foreign exchange reserves, uh, foreign exchange reserves have plummeted below $600 uh, billion, primarily because of the fact that Reserve Bank has been intervening in the uh, spot market. It has also been intervening in the forwards uh, market also to arrest the uh, rupee slide. But I think there is a limit to how much the Reserve Bank can intervene because uh, they keep they, they talk about their forex reserves being uh, in comfortable position. They are able to cover these X months of imports and so on. So if they continue to intervene by, uh, you know, buying rupees and selling dollars, that argument they will not be able to make. So beyond the point, they will, uh, there will be some limit to how much they can uh, intervene. Uh, but they have now employed the other method. So they have uh, the one way of uh, arresting rupee slide is through uh, intervention, exchange rate management. They are also now doing exchange rate management through capital controls. So as you see, yesterday, the Reserve Bank came up with these uh, measures to uh, augment the flow of uh, foreign exchange into the country. So that is also one instrument, one lever that they have uh, to, uh, you know, uh, encourage the inflows of capital. So they have liberalized external commercial borrowing. They have liberalized uh, some limits of foreign investment in government debt and corporate bond. So these are all the things they are doing to arrest the rupee slide and to uh, to rein in the current account deficit. Uh, but what again needs to be seen is whether these steps would, while they are in the right direction, but whether these would be 
effective to uh, prevent the rupee from sliding further it's uh, it's it, it needs to be seen because while if they would have been taken in normal uh, times uh, the impact would have been different but at a time when there are more push factors you know uh, causing the uh, dollar to flow out uh, at a time when dollar bond yields are rising uh, people would prefer investments in dollar denominated assets so while these measures would help in boosting sentiment uh their impact in the medium term would be seen but in the immediate term it won't be too effective so what we are seeing is that the reserve bank of india is managing exchange rate also it's trying to manage uh, inflation also and at the same time uh, it is also trying to manage the government uh, uh, borrowing side by side it keeps uh, you know coming up with some measures to uh, incentivize banks to invest in government bonds Uh, so it it is it's becoming increasingly complicated because at a time when the uh, interest rates are rising interest rate on government borrowings will also rise so the reserve bank will have to make a call between whether they want to keep the interest rates low uh, to support government borrowing or to uh, increase interest rates to manage inflation so you know that is why we have always been talking about having an independent debt management office and to you know take away this responsibility of debt management from rbi because in situations like this the complication becomes uh, you know you can see the trade off very clearly yeah and also <clears throat> i mean there is now more pressure to ease capital controls also i mean as <laughs> to consider it as one of the instruments to ease some of the pressure on the bank on the reserve bank as well and under these kind of situations such decisions can can be taken perhaps and that we do not be taken otherwise uh now uh I'm just kind of uh, ending on a crystal gazing kind of uh, note said uh, again two parts one is it how do you see what is your kind of there are different scenarios one can paint but what is your scenario for especially inflation in india because there are decisions i mean there have been monetary policy actions taken there are some fiscal decisions taken and they may be more taken but i mean going forward is it 6 months from now do you see inflation coming within the uh, uh, tolerance band in india and sim- and uh, similarly on the global uh, scale do you see this as a i mean we're uh, going by your understanding of economic history and how these episodes play out the war may uh, you know uh, end at some point or at least will become less of a factor hopefully over time other factors may also change but do you see this as going beyond suppose say december 2022 or or is this something which is which is likely to last longer what is your scenario so scenario on inflation is that you know it will remain elevated and uh, talking about uh, cpi inflation in india it will uh, it is likely to remain elevated till the uh, end of the year because uh, even if the war is to end tomorrow was to end tomorrow there will be some time uh, for you know the stabilization to take place for supply chains to repair and so on so inflation is likely to remain elevated then even going by rbs projection it's not going to be uh, you know uh, uh, reduced till uh, the end of the year it, it will take at least till the end of the year to come to the uh, inflation band of 6% but my view point is that it will uh, linger on beyond that point inflation will remain a problem uh, uh, not just because of domestic factors but because of global headwinds and the fact that now inflation has become more broad based it has become entrenched it has shifted to services also so it's not just one or two factors driving inflation it's a broad based thing and even if the global factors start to you know moderate like we are seeing uh, metal prices moderating if you look at the uh, aluminum prices copper prices they have fallen from their uh, high even if you look at crude oil it's it has started to retreat uh, but these factors will take some time so i think towards the first half of the calendar year of next year we should see some moderation in inflation but uh, what we also need to worry about at the same time is uh, the uh, what will happen to growth uh, how the growth will pan out in the uh, coming few uh, uh, quarters because if there is high and sustained inflation it it, it impacts growth it impacts consumption uh, it affects the discretionary consumption employment and so on 
So those things are also to be seen, what we are uh, seeing in other countries about, you know, the combination of high inflation and weak growth, how much of that spills over to India, that is also uh, will become more clear over the next uh, couple of months. If you were on the MPC, would you recommend another hike in the next MPC meeting? Yes, definitely. Another, uh, at least two to three uh, hikes more so that the uh, we have the real interest rate turning at least uh, positive or uh, your, you know, right now the policy repo rate is 4.9 and uh, inflation is 7% if we go by the uh, last month's uh, print, though to some extent, it was driven by base effect, and we should actually see some more months inflations to see uh, to make a statement of on whether uh, inflation has started moderating, it has peaked or not. Uh, so, we should see two to three more rounds of uh, uh, repo rate hikes. The quantum can, uh, you know, uh, vary. It may well be that they front load more rate hikes in the first two meetings, and then they start to taper off. So that is one thing that needs to be seen. But there would be at least two uh, cycles of rate hikes. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. This was very informative and uh, a lot of wisdom of many years of thinking and working on uh, macroeconomic issues. I think with in issues of macroeconomics, it takes a lot of time to actually develop good judgment because you have to see many cycles play out and then you develop a sense of judgment. And I think you, you've been at it for such a long time that you have that sort of intuition now. And then we are very thankful that you could join us today. Thank you. Thank you, Suyash. Thank you for the very insightful discussion. We'll be back in two weeks with a new episode. To make sure you don't miss, subscribe to Carnegie India on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher or wherever you get your podcast from. To learn more about our research and team, you can visit carnegieindia.org. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram. Thank you for listening. See you next time.